Hello, everyone. My name is Andrea Rowe, and I'm the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Specialist at the Global Institute for Water Security and Global Water Futures here at the University of Saskatchewan. Before we begin, I just have a couple of quick housekeeping notes that if you would like to listen to today's webinar in French, you can do so by clicking on the globe-shaped interpretation button on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Similarly, we have live English closed captioning uh, that is available if you press the CC button on the bottom toolbar. The webinar will be one hour in length and participants will remain muted throughout. However, there will be a question and answer uh, section for the remaining 10 minutes. So if you'd like to put your questions uh, into the Q&A box, we will be sure to ask them to our participants uh, at the end of the of the hour. Um, I want to acknowledge that we are participating today from the traditional territories of the First Peoples across this country. Those of us in Saskatoon are gathering here today on Treaty 6 territory and the traditional territory of the Métis. The University of Saskatchewan is committed to honoring and supporting the Indigenous peoples, Indigenous cultures, Indigenous values, and Indigenous languages that belong to the land. Water is the lifeblood of people and societies connecting us. And we pay our respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of the Saskatoon region and reaffirm our relationship with one another and with the land and waters that are essential to our health and well-being. I invite those of you joining from other territories today to reflect on and recognize the lands and waters you call home and set an intention to have a positive uh, discussion for today. I would also like to recognize the sponsors of today's event, Global Water Futures, the Global Water Futures Young Professionals, and the Global Institute for Water Security for committing the resources to make today's event possible. And I would also like to extend a special welcome to the Global Water Futures Young Professionals, uh, and many of whom have gathered in person today for watch parties, including one here in South Kitu, um, and the other young professionals who are participating at Laurier, Waterloo, and McMaster. Um, I very pleased to introduce today's lecture on flood warnings and maps, water models, and tools in practice. Uh, yesterday, March 8th, as many of you may know, marked International Women's Day. And the United Nations theme for this year was Digit All, Innovation and Technology for Gender Equality. When we think about innovation and technology in water, we know that women are underrepresented in the modeling community. Furthermore, the utility of predictive models in times of climate extremes, including floods and droughts, have intersectional impact based on gender, age, socioeconomic status, geographic location, and more. I'm delighted uh, that today's host, Dr. Chandra Rajalapati, guests Dr. Trisha Stadnik, and Dr. Maniri Faramarazi will provide different perspectives as women in modeling. They will share their current research, including the technical aspects of how models contribute to what we know about water and how to use this information effectively to consider the social implications of water models with respect to climate extremes. And so I will just give a very brief introduction of our guests. Their full biographies are available online and I encourage you to check them out there as there's far more than I can say in this short time. But I will introduce our host and guests and then I'll pass it over uh, to each one of them uh, starting with Chandra to share a little bit about their work before they move into the constructive conversation format. Dr. Chandra Rajalapati is an assistant professor at the University of Manitoba. She worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Saskatchewan and after uh, obtained the, her doctoral degree from the um, Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, India. She received a joint fellowship from the Pacific Institute of Mathematical Sciences and the Global Water Futures Program, uh, given her interdisciplinary research in statistics and hydrology. Her research focuses on developing statistical models, downscaling schemes, and novel probabilistic tools for hydroclimatic, hydroclimatology. She works on understanding historical and future changes in hydroclimatic variables, including perception, uh, precipitation and temperature at different spatial and temporal scales. Estimating risk due to extreme events such as floods, droughts, and heat waves, and developing adaptation and mitigation strategies. She is also interested in big data analysis, parallel computing, and machine learning techniques. Dr. Trisha Stapnik uh, is the Canada Research Chair for Hydraulic Modeling and full professor at the University of Calgary, Department of Geography, and a registered professional engineer in Manitoba and Alberta. 
She leads a team of dedicated engineers and scientists researching continental scale water supply and hydraulic assessments under changing climates with particular emphasis on extreme events and uh, continental scale water supply. She is currently the vice president of the International Association for Hydraulic Sciences, a Tracer Commission, a national director for the Canadian Water Resources Association and president and CEO of a consulting company, um, Hydros Engineer Limited. And finally, Dr. Miniri Varadley uh, is an associate professor in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Alberta, Canada. She received her PhD from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in 2010, and she is currently leading the Watershed Science and Modeling Laboratory that involves developing and applying physical, biogeochemical, and process-based tools such as hydraulic agricultural and climate models to study water and food challenges in the context of climate change. Her research focuses on assessing trade-offs uh, and interactions between water and land resources, crop production, and socioeconomic drivers for environmentally informed management plans. To date, her research has elaborated on subjects related to the impacts of climate change and management factors on crop yields, stream flow, floods, droughts, and more recently on nutrients and chemical, uh, chemical loads and transport in agricultural lands of the Canadian prairie. Her research goal is to contribute to the science of water, food, energy, and environment nexus under uncertain future in the Anthropocene. Well, thank you so much, uh, each of you. What, how lucky we are to have such an accomplished guest. So I will now turn it over to uh, Chandra to share a little bit about your work. Uh, thanks, Andrea, for the introduction. So I'll start sharing my screen. Yeah, let me know if you can see my screen. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, Dr. Chandra Rajula Bhatti. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Manitoba. And I'll give a brief overview of uh, uh, how my research contributes to assessing floods. As uh, I'll give, I mean, I'll, I'll not take more than five minutes. And I would like to hear more from our guest today, Dr. Trish and uh, Dr. Monire. So, as we all know, that uh, data plays a uh, you know, very crucial role or in any field and specifically in hydrology, as we are talking about flood warning, uh, warnings and the maps, reliable data is highly important for assessing the flood risk or for developing uh, ad adaptation or mitigation measures. Uh, my research work is on assessing uncertainties in hydrometeorological data and, uh, and understanding climate impacts on hydrometeorological variables and their extreme events such as floods, droughts, or heat waves and uh, the statistical modeling is a kind of, uh, you know, uh, binding uh, binding methodology for both uh, these uh, goals. So, uh, we first look at the historical data to understand uh, and model the changes in the precipitation and temperature or the concurrent effects such as the impacts of increasing temperature on precipitation amount or, and occurrences over the globe and at various uh, regional, global and the city scales. And we also model the spatial uh, changes of precipitation over a city or a region to understand why certain parts of the city are more flooded compared to the other parts. Um, here, uh, in, in this figure, we uh, show the uh, spatial changes of precipitation over, uh, over Bangalore city uh, using a Bayesian hierarchical model to understand the precipitation changes uh, over, over and around the Bangalore city here. Uh, next, we also model the changes in uh, extreme events such as heat waves as shown here with the increasing temperatures to understand uh, how the heat waves have been changing in different uh, cities uh, over Canada here. I'm just showing for Toronto and Saskatoon. Uh, but uh, it is not just that, uh, you know, we have to understand the historical uh, changes, but we also have to uh, understand how the future climate is going to be. Uh, which is really important for understanding again the changes in the extreme events like the floods or the heat waves, uh, and and the climate models uh, are are the are you know one of the useful tools to understand the future climate. Uh, but we before using these climate models, we first ask the question on how good are these climate models in simulating the observed uh, meteorological data. So uh, hydrometeorological data. So we compare the observed data with the historical simulations and assess which models or scenarios are close to the observations. 
uh, we just don't stick to the average uh, average values of the average statistic, but we also look into the higher order statistics such as the higher order movements to understand the tail properties like uh, like, like the skewness and or the kurtosis uh, coefficients, which are you know the useful uh, measures for understanding the extreme uh, changing extreme events in terms of magnitude and their frequency. Uh, and we also see the observed persistence properties if they are uh, simulated well or not. Uh, additionally, we also see this if uh, the extreme events, such as here, I'm showing for the drought severity, uh, drought duration, and the severity here. Uh, but if these uh, extreme events are being uh, well simulated or well reproduced, uh, what we have been noticing historically or not, so we we do such analysis, and we uh, note that uh, there you know there are uh, regional uh, at regional scales there are still biases in the climate models, so we uh, develop different methods to. Uh, remove the bias and use these climate model simulations uh, in 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 the real world applications that we can use in in either a hydrological modeling or or any other uh, you know uh, any any other uh, model to understand the changes uh, in the hydrometeorological variables. Uh, here I'm just showing the uh, heat and cold waves for large Canadian cities, which we have assessed for four different scenarios based on the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, for example, the red one, uh, the red line shows here for uh, an SSP 585 is a scenario with the highest emissions of 8.5 watts per meter square by the end of the century, and this is the lowest, uh, lo lowest one for uh, with 2.6 uh, 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 watts per meter square by the end of the century. Uh, so next, uh, in addition to all this analysis, there are also several uncertainties abound in in each part of the modeling process. So starting with the data, we there are different sources of data are, are available. And here, precipitation from uh, if if we look at the precipitations from ground observation, satellites, and rain analysis, we we try to understand what is the difference between these products, and how to consider these differences or the uncertainties in in further modeling. And we also understand the tail characteristics based on different distributions and also different fitting methods to obtain the estimates of the parameters of these distributions. And finally, not to forget uh, that there is also huge uncertainty associated with the climate models and uh, and their scenarios, which requires close attention while assessing the extreme events. Uh, here, uh, we show the difference among the models and the scenarios for the heat waves in mega cities around the globe. Uh, yeah, all this information is uh, crucial in hydrological models where fl flood maps are developed. And it is also important to have such information beforehand for mitigation and adaptation purposes. Uh, whether it could be, you know, you know, for a specific high precipitation event where the devastating flooding has been occurred at, in, in a certain place or to generate, you know, what if scenarios to understand how much flooding can be reduced if, if uh, rainwater harvesting uh, is being implemented in all the places uh, or, or it could be for a sustainable living. Or to understand the resilience of of a city where one needs to know when they can get back home after a flooding situation in their region. Uh, so Canada uh, specifically has been uh, seen several devastating events in the past, and if this and and we see that the temperature is been increasing in Canada at the double the rate of the global temperature anomaly, and uh, then and this also keeps uh, increasing the risk of the flooding. Uh, in, it, it is much higher than what we are seeing today. And if the uh, temperature anomaly increases from 1.5 degrees to 2 degrees centigrade, the risks to various systems, as shown here, also uh, increases according to the IPCC report. Uh, thank you. And here is my uh, contact information. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. And thank you. And over to you, uh, Andrea. Great, thank you. And now we'll pass it over to Trisha to share a brief presentation on your work. Excellent. Can everyone see the slides okay? Perfect. So my name is Professor Trisha Stadnik, and I am joining you today from the land known as Mokinstis, which is where the Bow meets the Elbow River, otherwise known as the city of Calgary and home of Métis Region 3. Okay. So the Intact Insurance Institute for Climate Change recently gave Canada a grade of C for their disaster preparedness. And the reality is that we need to fast track flood mitigation to avoid increasing the cost of disaster mitigation and disaster response. Uh, from the Canadian Natural Disasters database, we can see that the rate of increase of natural disasters that have hit Canada 
has been increasing exponentially by every single decade since the early 1900s. And a significant number of those natural disasters are actually associated with hydrological events, which includes storms, drought, wildfire induced by droughts, and flood scenarios. Climate change means that we are living with more frequent extremes and extreme events, but this figure from a recent report by the Canadian Council for Academies demonstrates that it's not just the frequency of events that's increasing, but also the consequence, and that's what's shown on the x-axis. The symbols represent different sectors, and their position represents the panel's assessment of the relative consequence, and that includes based on disruption, the cost or the amount of damages, and losses. And this is based on the next 20 years. So climate change um, is a very complicated topic. And how does this connect with my research? So I attempt to provide data that helps to underpin the socioeconomic and policy-based decisions that our leaders and governments need to make in order to protect us and our infrastructure. And I'm going to give you the Coles Notes version of how this works. So very simply, you just saw an entire presentation on climate models um, from Chandra which is basically the upper layer of this. From those climate models, we typically extract the most common variables such as changing temperature and changing precipitation. We then feed those into what we call a hydrologic model. And what a hydrologic model's sole purpose is to do is to predict the volume of water on the landscape. And so we distribute that precipitation and temperature across a landscape, such as the one shown in the top middle here, um, and we predict where that water is going. And then at a certain point, we predict how much volume there is. And that's the bottom left. And we get a range of those scenarios because oftentimes the climate models are giving us a range of what is happening. If we then want to translate that information into a flood map, then we need to actually get a level instead of a volume. And so we use a hydraulic model or something um, to do for, to translate the volume into a water level. Um, and for that, we superimpose the volume of water into the river and across the landscape. And that gives us the different colors that you see represented on this map, which represent different water levels and different risk factors to people living in those areas. But all of this is very complex. And as Chandra did a very good job of illustrating, there's uncertainties and vulnerabilities in every step of this process. So where do the uncertainty lie? Where does the uncertainty lie? We would be mindful to take a step back and ask ourselves, not if our models are good enough, but what are they actually good for? And what are they supposed to be doing? What we need are stronger mechanisms to connect the science to the operations and then the operations to the policy and governments. This will require a new generation of leaders that is trained in both the physical and social sciences. The accuracy of the models and their predictions is however, a huge risk and currently a barrier to the application of science in operations. Can we trust the models? How reliable are they? Do they estimate the design flow from a range of output and how do we pick the right flow? And what risk level do we accept? This is illustrated by an excerpt from Kenneth Arrow during the Second World War when there was monthly uh, weather forecasts being generated. The statisticians actually got together and said, we don't believe that these weather models are any good and can you pull them from operations? The reply from Kenneth Arrow actually read, the commanding general is well aware that the forecasts are no good. However, he needs them for planning purposes and they remained in effect. So complexity leads to a gap in terms of the uptake of the relevant and timely science. We need to recognize that if our models are actually useful, um, that will um, a, up, increase the uptake of their operational relevance. And so if we're producing something relevant, they will in fact be used. The last but not least is the policy piece. The Canadian Council of Academies produced this infographic to highlight the interrelated complexities between human decision-making and the physical sciences domain. So at the bottom, bottom, you have governance and capacity, and each of these boxes represents a different physical or human ecosystem. And each arrow represents a distinct risk imposed by governance policy. The takeaway is that good governance is complicated. <laughs> these challenges, I argue engineering and science is ill posed to currently challenge, in part due to a lack of diversity in the profession and due to a lack of training in both the social and the physical sciences. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
I will invite Omani Ray to uh, Dr. Omani Ray to start the presentation. Right. Can you and can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. Uh, so thank you very much for the introduction because of the time limitation I'm trying to actually navigate. So, okay. Um, so I would like to start from here about water crisis that and has been considered as the um, largest global risk and the reason for regional insecurity. For the first time formally um, in 2015 by World Economic Forum. So water crisis, so this is water security challenges, which is a, such a multi-dimensional and multi-aspect multi, multi -aspect problem. So then then within the context of water crisis, there has been evolving number of uh, kind of research works. And, and it, this topic has been, has been, as we already know, has been actually taken up by um, many groups and has been discussed in many, many occasions. And more, more recently, um, the UNESCO International Hydrological Program um, within their uh, phase eight water security and um, uh, responses to, to local, regional, global challenges report, they have listed different themes related to water, water security or water, water crisis challenges. So water crisis is not one single dimensional problem. And among their, their research focus, um, the water, uh, water scarcity um, or addressing water scarcity and water quality has been has been one of the research research themes. This is something that I would like to a little bit address here. So, what is water scarcity? When in a, in in general, when we talk about water scarcity, it's just very very simple. When um, our needs, water needs for for a different sectors plus environment, including environment, exceeds um, our water availability in terms of quantity and quality, then we we consider that as, as a water scarcity. But, but defining and quantifying water scarcity is not that simple because it has so many different dimensions itself within the context of bigger water water security challenges. And since 1980, there has been an evolving number of publications and research going towards understanding and quantifying or defining water scarcity to be prepared for future or predicting them for, for the future. And more, more recently, there has been because, because we have been uh, so fortunate um, having more more data accessibility and more improved models, there have been more research and more advancements in understanding uh, the water scarcity itself. So while there has been so many advancements in terms of modeling use, modeling works, water models applied for understanding and quantifying these water scarcity, and we have been even able to address um, the groundwater scarcity versus surface water scarcity. One time we haven't really had that in our agenda or we're not able because of the data limitation, but now we are. But it's still global water scarcity assessments. They are a lot of times suffering from um, other, other limitations and important limitations yet to be addressed. Uh, for example, I have listed in the left-hand side, a few of them, it's not limited to that. For example, in most jurisdictions and more, most stakeholders, uh, we're not considering green water as the source of water uh, for ourselves in our water budget. And yet green water, which is this uh, soil moisture, is in situ water that provides water for, for our ecosystem, for our environment, and for our food production. And yet 70% and over 70% of a global food production is through green water. How to manage that, how to consider or account for green water in, in, in water scarcity assessments. And more importantly, extreme events. We talk a lot about flooding. We talk about and a lot about droughts. And especially these extreme events not only are important in our rivers and have implications for our society in our cities, in our urban and, and urban areas, but also in our agriculture, in our, our landscapes, when they when the water um, exceeds its its requirement, when there is extreme wet 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 and um, kind of times or extremely dry times. How that and does it affect green water and therefore agricultural food production and how we can consider this in, in water scarcity assessments. Or more importantly is this is very exciting because because when we're talking about water scarcity, we're talking about how much our needs in different sectors are not gonna exceed our environment carrying capacity or or tipping point, the water, the water quantity or the water quality that our environment need to sustain. We want we don't want to exceed those tipping points. So far, with even with a lot of advancements in modeling, these tipping points, these tipping points that are needed to 
classify which region is considered as water scarcity so that we can plan these tipping points are considered really based on some best guess and they are considered so uniformly applied over years and over times in different across different regions around the world but how to how to uh, systematically quantify that because there are so many natural processes and anthropogenic and kind of factors that define those tipping points in terms of the uh, quantity and water quality that our environment need and and, and needs and we don't want to exceed that and and other aspect that i'm interested in specifically is is the flow of food and the virtual water the virtual water is the hidden water or the water that is used in production process of many commodities including food including everything else we, we consume a lot of time in in water scarcity community when we apply models we want to take care of uh, in terms of assessing our water water consumption we only consider the water that is consumed in the production process of those you know the the local local water consumptions but a lot of time what we consume like in canada most of our food commodities are coming from outside like vegetable weed and and many other things so when we want to account for water scarcity we want to make sure that water the hidden water that is used to production process of these commodities um are considered properly because we're putting footprints somewhere else and how, how to quantify these aspects and, and so when, for example, um, within the context of like a food production and uh, thinking about global global bread basket, most of them we are located in mid to high latitude regions. So by definition, what is global bread baskets? Those are the areas that are major food food producing and export regions. So we produce good supply, um, you know, food uh, at the global scale so that not many countries or many jurisdictions um, have that capacity to produce food. So um, now Canadian prairies and US is as one of them are located in mid to mid to high latitude regions yet most agriculture or most um uh, global uh, projections and um, climate projections indicate um like more frequent uh, extreme events in the future how this going to change or impact our food production and how we're going to decide within that con context Thinking about Canadian prairie, uh, we know that um, this uh, Western Canada um, uh, produce a lot of food and we export actually to over 100 countries around the world every year or 170 countries around around, around the world. Majority of that, that is based on green water, but also blue water. So how to account for this within the context of extreme events and how to account for water scarcity? These are some of the questions that my group and I, um, together with my collaborators from different uh, sectors, we try Try to use eco hydrogeological models uh, to address some of these key questions. What are those tipping points? How we can sustain our agricultural and food commodities, their production, while meeting water quantity and quality uh, requirements of our environment? And this is a big question that requires a lot of inter integration with a lot of groups, and especially when it comes to uh, uh, climate change extremes. And so that that's I have this my last slide that, uh, slide that addressing water scarcity, which is already itself very multidisciplinary or inter interdisciplinary and kind of question, uh, but think bigger within the context of water crisis that uh, kind of covers many many other aspects from cultural to to um, and social to economical uh, aspect uh, that requires integration and collaboration of many many disciplines because that's how is the nature of water and and our environment uh, that's how it works. And so we're, I think we're so fortunate that we're living in the era where, where these interdisciplinary approach or interdisciplinary research has been already recognized and there are so much incentives and kind of promotions um, award that. So hoping that at one time we will be able to work even transdisciplinary manner because that's how exactly our nature works and how exactly um, us human as a part of bigger ecology that's how we are integrated within biosphere according to these beautiful uh, very exciting kind of um, uh, papers uh, that uh, that um, hopefully we can we can get there with with more advancements in the waters and and the data thank you very much i think that's all what i have for now i hope i'm not too long and please feel free to to actually um, and get some more information if you are interested in some of our works through uh, my lab and uh, kind of um, uh, link here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Trisha and Dr. Monire from, for bringing out, uh, you know, the several challenges on the flooding uh, or handling floods or, you know, the water crisis, which are, I would say, you know, the both edges of, I mean, the both 
it it is the whole world of spectrum where on one side we have to handle these floods and on the other side we also have i have to handle uh, the water scarcity uh, so uh, maybe i'll i'll uh, start uh, with the question and answer session for uh, which uh, for for this uh, flood uh, for flood war warnings and maps uh, so the first question is uh, you know I i'm just thinking so when we think about this climate change and the need for adaptation and mitigation, uh, how do we use these uh, any of these models, like you know, any hydrological model for uh, preparedness uh, in terms of floods? Uh, so I would uh, request uh, Dr. Trish to start uh, with uh, with your opinion. Sure. Thank you, Chandra. Um, I think you summed it up nicely on some of your slides where you very uh, pointedly illustrated that we use these models for testing what if scenarios. Yeah. Uh, and and I think we, between the three of us, highlighted the complexities involved here and the uncertainties. And we, mm -hmm. the reality is nobody really has a crystal ball that knows exactly what's going to happen. So the best way that we can arm ourselves and be prepared for climate change, mitigation and adaptation is to test different scenarios of precipitation and temperature, and then follow that through the entire modeling chain and take a look at how that affects the volume, how that affects the levels and the flood inundation, and how that affects the eco-hydrology and subsequent socioeconomic impacts downstream of the water supply that Monterey really nicely highlighted. Um, so how much water would be there now versus in the future, and what consequences does it have in terms of the amount that it's going to change by? Yeah, uh, you know, as as you have uh, nicely mentioned, I mean, nicely put your points in terms of you know uh, generating these water scenarios for uh, uh, for understanding you know how how it has been uh, the flooding situation has been evolving in the in the historically and then how it could be for the future and if we have some kind of estimation through these. Uh, uh, you know, it could be data from several other models where one one uh, one uh, is one source is a, a climate model, and then if we try to put this in all this information in a hydrological model, um, yeah, there is uh, definitely a source where we can uh, get these uh, flood maps uh, for different kind of precipitation events, uh, which had occur, which where the flooding has occurred in the previous in, in previously. And certainly the climate change has been, uh, you know, have a devastating effect on uh, several aspects, including the, uh, you know, the land use land cover changes, uh, which has been happening. And, you know, generating such kind of what-if scenarios and understand uh, the flooding situation would be definitely helpful. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, Dr. Monire, what, what is your uh, take on, uh, you know, the uh, climate change and the need for adaptation and uh, mitigation? or how, how are we going to, you know, prep these models for preparedness uh, to flooding? Yeah, I think, I think this is a very difficult question because mm -hmm. when it comes to climate change and adaptation, as it's been beautifully covered by Trisha and yourself, it's such a multi-dimensional and complex question when it comes to adaptation to future climate change. So it has not only the physical science of water, and water scarcity or floods or or any extreme events. It has so much cultural and social and economic dimensions. So I think what we're doing here, as also mentioned by Tricia or yourself, we're really thinking about, we're contributing to aspect of that that um, prepared, uh, preparedness for the future, future climate change extremes. So we build the models, we try our best to interpret our models as mm, precise and accurate as possible, and then provide this information to policymakers, to in industries, to whoever has, um, you know, um, those tools or capacity to put different layers of information from societal, from economic, from different sectors to decide for preparedness for the future. What we're really doing, we're examining those what if questions of the physical impacts, say it's volume of water, whether it's, it's the scarcity of water, whether it's is the water quality or quantity or agricultural food production, but how to prepare, I think we're just providing aspect of that by building these models. I think it's a little bit naive if we think like my model would be used for preparedness, but it would be like used definitely provide extremely important information for them. And the other thing that I, I want to actually address here, and I'm so excited because 
um, the science of climate change itself is is changing. I think, including adaptation as well. We are we are really at this exciting moment of um, big data revolution right now. So so much digital data now is available where it was not in the past. So integration of these data would actually advance our knowledge and our modeling capacity as well which will provide our better understanding of the climate change science itself. Like one time, probably we didn't know how ocean is interacting with atmosphere, how it is interacting with human, with land use, with everything else. So now with the data and capacity we have and more advancement with the modeling we are building, so the, our knowledge of climate change itself is changing and therefore our preparedness for future. So I think this is really exciting field to be in because there is so much, I see a lot of opportunities. So. Yeah, uh, you are right, uh, Dr. Monre, there are definitely a lot of opportunities. And then since you have brought these, uh, you know, uh, the modeling and all, but you know, how how reliable are these modeling predictions? I mean, uh, Dr. Trisha has already put in her in her presentation that let us not ask how good are these models, uh, right? Uh, but, you know, or or maybe uh, it is like, you know, why can't, why can't we have confidence in using these uh, modeling predictions? Uh, yeah, Dr. Trishka, you maybe you can start uh, oh, telling us more. Sure, sure. thank you. Um, okay, so I would pose that question to the audience and say, how many people trust the weather tomorrow? I don't know about you, but ever since moving to Calgary, that would be like 0% chance. I don't even trust. I looked it up last night and then I woke up this morning and we ended up driving the kids to school because it was too cold for them to walk. Um, and And so typically speaking, we have this innate understanding that the weather forecasts are inherently unreliable and that we're somehow okay with that. We just kind of accept this risk and live with it. Um, but when it comes to flood forecasting, uh, the public can be extremely harsh on the flood forecasters uh, to the point that, you know, you can almost never win. If they predict a flood and there isn't one, then they the forecasters get in trouble for wasting all the money to prepare for the flood. And if they don't predict a flood and there is one, then they get in trouble for not having the readiness and preparedness. And I would say at the end of the day, I think the modeling chain that I showed illustrates that it depends on the weather forecast. And none of us really un um, accept that the weather is super reliable. Um, not much more so than rolling a dice and saying a 50-50 chance that it's going to rain or be sunny. Um, the problem with flood forecasting uh, and flood mapping is that oftentimes what we're talking about here in Canada or in other snow dominated regimes is that we're doing a spring outlook, a forecast of how high the peak flow is going to get due to the melting of the snowpack. Well, the problem there actually becomes that we have to forecast so far in advance based on conditions that we may or may not know today with a super amount of accuracy. So we have a limited amount of observations and I agree with Monterey, this is a really exciting time that we're starting to see the advent of space-based technologies and remote sensing that can be integrated into the models and can help improve the reliability of the forecasts by telling us uh, how much snow there is on the ground. And then in turn, we can use that for a long-term outlook to say how much volume of water do we expect there to be based on a certain depth of snow. But we're really only at the cusp of being able to do that. And if we have to accept a lot of uh, uncertainty in the weather forecast, then I think it's just a reality that we're going to have to accept a lot of uncertainty in our flow and flood forecasts as well. Yeah, so I, I totally agree, you know, when you brought this uncertainty issues where, uh, you know, even in the weather forecast that they, they never say that, you know, there are sometimes, you know, there is a hundred percent chance of precipitation and then you don't see it, but there is some kind of uncertainty associated with a number. And it is important, you know, we, we consider such uncertainties as well with respect to, you know, a different stage of uh, modeling process and then uh, and then look into these predictions and then see how reliable they are. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Monire, what do you think of, uh, you know, this uh, reliability of these uh, climate model predictions and you have already brought in uh, the issues of, uh, I mean, brought in the uh, capability of this big data where we can use, uh, you know, data from several sources and try to make the models more reliable than than they were uh, in the past. Exactly. So I, I totally agree, agree with Tricia and yourself. So and I think the same environmental models, so a little bit bigger than even water models, 
So they are really digital representation of the physical world, right? So it's not more than that. So models are simplification of reality. So this is the concept of model in general, other one is reality. So I think um, because we are representing this physical, big, complex environment, which is land, water, soil, vegetation, and human, everything in it with atmosphere. So we're already thinking about many different layers of information and data, and we already agree on that that there are there has been at least in the past a lot of a lot of data problems because the better the data, the better, the better your model would be. So the uncertainty is inherent, inherently associated with 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 modeling um, and like kind of pro, um, predictions. But I think um, when thinking about climate change or adaptation and future predictions. I think we have to realize that there is a huge difference between forecast, prediction, and projection. We are not predicting anything when it comes to future. Even if we have the perfect model right now, we don't know about the future. Nobody can predict how, how the future is going to evolve in terms of, at least because of the human dimension and because of the socioeconomic uh, pathways and trajectories. And that's why we have those many scenarios already developed by many groups towards which direction um, this world is, is, is actually going, uh, which may impact the climate and global warming and et cetera. So I think as long as we recognize we, we are able to um, quantify the uncertainty while examining those big but important questions for future to be prepared and, and communicate. Be careful in communicating how we are communicating or how we are interpreting model results to avoid any misinterpretation or misleading people. I think um, these, this is exciting for the still I would still um, love to be a modeler <laughs> because without which it's it's almost impossible to do anything for future, given the complexity of, of the nature of water and water scarcity. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I totally agree uh, with you, you know, especially uh, when it comes to the communication part, uh, mm -hmm. you have, uh, since you have brought it up, uh, you know, the communication uh, is, is required at several levels, but it is not just with the, mm -hmm. you know, from the government to the, to the end user or, or, or to the person who is affected by the flood but it has to be you know the communication has to be from uh, uh from a researcher's desk or uh, you know to how we are going to implement the research in in the real time and then how how much uh, it is useful for the end, uh, end, uh, end, and and uh, and you know affected person or an end user or a stakeholder i would say so uh, my, uh, I would like to ask if what is what are the barriers in in these uh, flood science communication specifically? Uh, maybe again, I'll start with your Trish. <laughs> sure. Um, so I think that figure that I showed with the connection between the science, uh, the operations, and the governance uh, or policy is where I'd like to start because really I see <clears throat> um, each layer of that being disconnected and disjointed right now, and I think we really need to do a much better job communicating amongst even the different water sectors themselves. So there's a very different kind of uh, person or water specialist that works on the governance and policy piece than the people like ourselves that work on the science piece. Um, and that's similarly, even between science and operations. And so there I'm talking about more of the academics and the role of research versus the, the research that's put into practice or the state of the art practice that's used by the environmental consultants, the hydropower industry, uh, the agriculture industry. They're, they're very different tools. They're very different expectations of what is considered complex or easy to understand, um, and, and sometimes even with different needs. And I think we don't often do a good job at circling back <laughs> through that whole cycle. And I think we can put that on ourselves to say that we need to do a better job in communicating. But I'd also like to add that typically speaking, um, it was the operations people, the people producing the operational forecasts which in Canada, at least, is oftentimes the engineering community that was responsible for communicating flood risk to the public. And as a trained engineer, I can say this, we suck at communication. <laughs> um, and I'm not trying to be controversial. It's just that we're often trained and it's written right in even in our code of ethics um, to be very conservative in how we communicate. And in some ways, I think we communicate very technically to make sure or to try to inhibit that information from being translated in the wrong hands in a different way, well, I think it backfired because now it's just this led to this spread of misinformation. 
Take, for example, the one in 100 year flood. That is a terrible terminology and I hate it. We're stuck with it. But when I say that to someone that's not a trained hydrologist, then they often interpret it. Um, I used to live in Manitoba where you are now, Chandra, and they'd be like, great, we had a one in 100 year flood. We're safe for another 100 years. No. <laughs> what that actually means is that there's a 1% chance every single year of a 100 year flood magnitude, that volume of water occurring. It doesn't mean just because we've had one that that risk doesn't carry forward. Um, and how the last example I want to give is just from a personal perspective, even as hydrologists, how many of us consider flood risk uh, when we're buying a home? That's the largest purchase that we make in our entire life. Um, I'm probably, you know, <laughs> I, I go too far, but um, I really consider this seriously. I love rivers. I love water. I would never buy a house near rivers and water. Um, we literally handed our real estate agent a map of the flood inundation from the 2013 Calgary flood with all the pretty colors. And the real estate agent's like, oh, what's this? Is this where you want to look for a house? I'm like, no, I don't want a house anywhere where there's a color. <laughs> um, so our real estate agents, our insurance industry, they're not prepared to have these discussions with people. And then people end up finding themselves in situations that they didn't expect because of a lack of communication. Oh, okay, I I love the idea of you know taking the flood <laughs> flood risk map for buying a for purchasing a house. But I, uh, you know, I think uh, most cities are are uh, by the side of the river, and I think it is de definitely important you know to have uh, you know clearly demark uh, uh, the areas uh, from the historical events. Um, yeah, that 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 definitely helps. So. Um, Dr. Monire, so what, do, what is your state on, uh, you know, communication, science communication to the end user or, or the communication among the, you know, different sectors? Yeah, I think on um, top of what just uh, Tricia mentioned, so a little bit of because this is woman plus, I would like to a little bit put in the context of woman, uh, talking, thinking about the barriers. So um, as Tricia mentioned, our communicate, our audience are many people because of the complexity and because of the um, a, a interdisciplinarity of the, our research in general. So we communicate with industry, we communicate with government, we communicate with, with producers, we communicate with public. So each different language and different levels of, you know, how to, how to summarize these technical, highly complex science into, into the language that would be uptaken by each, each group is not easy. Easy task is very different. So different strategies are needed. So. When I'm thinking myself, just just myself, how I want to communicate. When I'm at the point that I can, I can do a good job in 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 kind of interpreting my results. Then I'm ready to communicate. How? What are those those layers or strategies that I should communicate? Um, I think there is no substitution for phone call, no substitution for really direct face to face meeting people, talking people, going through your your modeling, especially that when it's government, when it's industry, they have these well trained uh, technical experts. So it's probably easier job for us to communicate with them. But also for public, of course, we need to simplify. So we need to make them, you know, get the message in, in, in a way that is more understandable. But what is barrier here? I feel like um, a lot of time, we women uh, professors, we have a lot of other administrative jobs as well that we are tasked to do. So we're involved in EDI committee, we are involved in in review committee, in hiring committee, which is which is beautiful because it's part of our job, our our role. But then, because we are women and the population of women is so much really low as compared to men, a lot of time that that imposes a, another restriction that we can't, we just don't have time to do that. We just don't have enough time to effectively getting integrated with outside to communicate the, 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 the science that we produce. And I feel like this is the moment that I really appreciate these these initiative, these discussion. Um, and within the universities, a lot of recognition that I'm I'm sure um, will be very much better future by bringing more um, women, more underrepresented groups. Is not just women. So the more we are there, the more we are available to you know divide the task and so be there uh, when we want to communicate and therefore being involved in important um, you know discussions and important decisions. Hopefully. Yeah, uh, yeah, you uh, have, uh, uh, you know, there is no doubt about uh, bringing in uh, diversity in, in uh, any, you know, scientific research. There is no doubt, uh, uh, doubt about that. Um, so, 
uh, Andrea, do we have uh, some more time for discussion or would you like to take questions from the... No. Uh, because I have, you know, uh, uh, actually some more questions for me to discuss, but I'll uh, I'll leave it to you. I know you could keep talking, and, but there is already a nine questions from the audience uh, and we only have uh, nine minutes to go. So I will ask you some questions from the audience uh, very quickly here. And um, I'll post them to you and you can answer if it's relevant to your your work. But thank you so much for the, the discussion. The first question is, can you go more in depth into what green water is? I think this is for Maniri. Yeah. Okay, so absolutely. So the green water is, um, just trying to not to be technical, is, is soil water, is the soil moisture. Uh, often it's based on precipitation or based on if there is um, like higher groundwater level or if there is a um, snowmelt and it's low infiltration, for example. So that soil moisture supplies enough water for for our ecosystem, landscape, for forests, for vegetation, for grasslands, and for food production for, for our croplands, feed crops and, and other grain crops that we produce. That's the green water and that's the green water storage. So when, when these vegetation use or consume this, this water and, um, and takes or, or go through like kind of evaporates or go through transmission. So there is a transpir and aspiration comp component as well. That transpiration plus evaporation is called also like green water flow. But this is to too technical. My apologies. I want to be simple. So just think about soil moisture. That's a source of water for green, for green. And this is the green water source for ecosystem and food production. Okay, and then similarly, the question was asked, what is meant by global bread basket? Okay, so global bread basket. So these are major, major agricultural lands or major agricultural producing um, boundaries, whether it's natural boundaries like watersheds or um, political boundaries like, like nations, um, where they produce food, and not only for their and domestic consumption, but also for export to supply food for outside to contribute to global food security or global food supply. These are called um, bread baskets. Okay, great. I'm not going to answer the questions in order because I think they're all going back to the theory. So I'm just going to skip around here a little bit uh, and just ask, are there any models especially concerned with coastal inundation? Um. I haven't done that yet. So my research area have been, um, especially since when I immigrated to Canada, I've been mainly focused on prairie lands, Canadian prairies within the context of agriculture, food production. But I know there are a lot of, a lot of um, ag kind of um, eco geological or eco um, hydro eco geological models. They are specifically looking at issues um, with respect to coastal regions. It's not one, one single specific magic model like many other modeling works. But it's combination of different sorts of modeling, depending on what question they want to address. Of course, there are many of them out there. Yeah, so I'll just add, um, I don't do coastal modeling per se, um, but yes, there absolutely is. And I interface with coastal modelers to look at the Arctic Ocean and the impacts of freshwater entering the Arctic. That's a class of models called hydrodynamic models. And they're a hybrid between hydrologic and hy hydraulic models. And so they're really concerned with both the volume of water and the water level and how uh, the water moves across the landscape. Next question, uh, Chandra, if you could start, which is what strategies have worked for you when trying to connect, you know, your model operations with, you know, with sort of practice or science communication strategies? What, what has worked for you in the past? Okay, uh, I would say you know working with this uh, local or the provincial governments would uh, would would be always helpful in bringing our research or taking our research from uh, you know from our desks to uh, operations. So if if we have uh, you know developed uh, let us say uh, if we have uh, the you know projections for the next uh, 50, 60 years of precipitation and temperature and then see how the extreme events have been changing uh, over the you know the next century. So if we take this, uh, I mean, if we are, we try to work uh, uh, with the provincial government, for example, here with the local provincial government, where uh, we we, uh, we take our research to uh, to sh uh, to to put our uh, outputs in a hydrological model to see how the flooding situation has been changing 
uh, in in Manitoba. So that 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 is the best strategy so far for me uh, to take our research to the operations. Do you want to add anything to that, uh, Trisha Armaniri? Um, if there is time, just a quick note that my strategy, I think, I believe probably would work over long term and more effectively is when you when you make sure that you have well trained well trained um, members to actually um, train them how to accurately interpret their modeling results, and then when they end up in government or industry. Uh, that's where they actually communicate your modeling results more effectively than probably mm, any other strategies or maybe very effectively if it's not comparable because they have those skill set already trained how to interpret cautiously their modeling results when then when they end up in industry or, or government they have other and they develop other understanding of other layers of information so then there is a tremendous opportunity when they actually communicate with the end user and the sta stakeholders that's i feel like i'm in my my group i want to make sure that um and then my trainees they they develop that skill set to to interpret to um communicate so that when they are end up they end up in, in government. Most of my lab members end up in government, some in academia, some in industry, but mostly in, in government. So then then they have that necessary skill set. So this, I feel like this is a method or a strategy for knowledge mobilization or knowledge transfer translation that can happen this way as well. Trisha, did you want to add anything to that or? Sure, I'll just say that um... The whole reason why I developed a consulting business was to tackle this exact issue, actually. Um, and so interfacing or connecting with operations works best if you develop knowledge with operations. So it's a co-development process. If you do it outside of that, so science working on its own and then going to operations and saying, hey, look at this shiny new piece that I have. Um, it doesn't work very well. But if they're part of it from the ground up, then that they can inform what will work, what won't work. Um, and actually guide the development of the final product. And then they're more apt to use the final product because they feel more confident with it as well. So it's really a process of back and forth the whole way. Um, and those two shouldn't be two separate pieces, but they should actually be braided together and intertwined. That's great. I am so torn here because we're almost at the end, but there's still many questions. Uh, so I'll choose, I think, one last question. And um, it says, uh, Thank you so much for the, the wonderful talk. I'm curious how you see distributional impacts of water scarcity shifting from where it currently has the largest impacts to different communities over the next 50 years. Uh, maybe, Maneri, this is targeted to you, but if everyone has an answer on that one, that would be great. Yeah, this is very, very difficult question. That's that's why we, we need these models, right? So that's why we need to put together and collaborate with different disciplines, different people from different backgrounds, um, from ecology, from geology, from economic, from social, so that once we have these advanced tools and advanced models, hopefully we're able to project uh, what's going to happen in the future in terms of the water scarcity. As I already mentioned, I mean, this has been uh, so much evol evolving science so that um, a lot of advancements already done, but yet we're not, we're not at the point we, that where we know how to exact, how exactly to define even water scarcity or to quantify water scarcity. So what, what it means, there is not one single template that would work for everybody and every no, everywhere and every time. So water scarcity is such a, such a complex issue. It depends on, you know, from the water quality and water quantity perspective. So just again, thinking about this simple question, how to manage our needs so that we're not exceeding uh, the, the, the tipping point of our environment from water quality or water quantity perspective, but how to define those tipping points. And that is not something a study, some, something easy. So it requires a lot of interaction, a lot of layers of information that I'm hoping that with more data availability and more more advancements also in, in machine learning, in, in um, artificial intelligence, so putting together, advancing our knowledge in terms of the data first. Once the data and layers of information and data are available, I'm sure um, there would be much more um, improvements in model for projecting where and how different different countries or nations or communities are going to affected by by water scarcity in the future. 
yeah uh, also on a different note actually you know when when the, when we are talking about this the, you know two two par, two sides of the spectrum where you know we are we are looking at the flooding situation or, and also we are looking at the water scarcity so th this uh, we can consider this you know flooding as a, a resource uh, you know to where you can uh, you know build into this uh, i mean uh, encourage this uh, rainwater harvesting schemes or uh, you know uh, collect all these floodwaters and then uh, you know use that as uh, uh, as a resource for the agriculture etc so it 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 is also a possibility that uh, floodwater can be considered as a resource than as a new sense actually yeah i'll just lastly add that this is where it connects back to the socioeconomic piece which i think is a piece that's really lacking um, if you take the droughts in California, for instance, many people will notice that over the last few weeks, it's been impossible to buy strawberries in Canada. That's because a large portion of our produce comes from California that has been under massive drought warnings. And that produce and supply chain is going to be cut off um, because the growth of vegetables and fruits obviously requires water, some crops being more intensive on water than others. Um, and when those crops are shipped, that's actually an export of water that we don't really think about. And so really thinking about our purchases as people um, and the role that we have to play in terms of determining water scarcity and either worsening or helping a situation is very important. Exactly. Thank you so much, Trisha. That's an extremely important point and, and very interesting how, how to account for water, virtual water trade. So because a lot of time, uh, water scarcity is is not local in the in a sense that what we consume we're putting footprint somewhere else. So if you just consider about like water consumption of your your domestic water consumption, you're a lot of time underestimating water scarcity because because the food you're you're consuming the because the commodity you're consuming from everything computers chips and everything they're based on water but a lot of time they're produced somewhere else so, so you're putting footprint somewhere somewhere else. So the question is how to bring those information in water scarcity accounting do we have enough information do we have enough data for that well thank you so much uh, to all of you uh Veneri, chandra and trisha for this wonderful discussion i know we could keep going but unfortunately the, the webinar has to has to end um and so i would like to thank everyone who has attended uh today's event uh, but you know that the next Women Plus Water lecture will be on March 23rd in honor of World Water Day. Um, we will have an exciting conversation about the climate crisis as a water crisis with host Dr. Inongi Malupi and guest Dr. Angela Martina Coretta and Tassine Jaffrey will provide perspectives on climate justice, gender poverty and environmental degradation, as well as the 2022 IPCC assessment on water. Uh, please register on the GWF website and we look forward to seeing you all next month.